Hello everyone. This is Gus Cairns. I'm coordinator of Prep in Europe. Um, uh, and welcome to the first um, webinar on Prep and Women in Europe. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for coming along. Um, we've had some difficulties with people joining. Uh, Zoom asked for a passcode when I didn't think it was going to. Um, so if you have, if you are here, well done for persisting and re-registering, which is what it seems people have to do. So we will uh, persist with our uh, so far 20 participants, which actually isn't bad. Um, and it's great to see you. Um, and uh, just a quick two minutes uh, of your time before we hand over to the first presenter, Silva Shoki from Paris. Um, I'm... Uh, Gus Cairns, coordinator of PrEP in Europe, as you may know, we are a uh, NGO partnership of six uh, uh, organizations in Europe, and we conduct a variety of things. We've conducted a couple of uh, PrEP summits. We've had various uh, webinars and we provide a lot of information and background um, advocacy um, data for people who want to uh, advocate for PrEP in Europe. This last year during the, the um, COVID lockdown, we've been concentrating on doing webinars for uh, particular affected groups, especially people not currently well served by PrEP. And this is the first one of two um, uh, um, webinars about women and PrEP, um, PrEP for women in Europe. The next one will be on 13th of July. Um, and um, as a way of linking the two, um, I will be making notes on this meeting and feeding them through as part of the feedback to the second meeting. Second meeting we already have um, two uh, speakers. We're waiting for a third. Um, Sophie Strachan um, of the Sophia Forum, a uh, prep advocacy organization in the UK, and Dr. Vanessa uh, Apia, who is um, HIV consultant in East London and responsible for one of the largest uh, cohorts of women on prep in the UK. Okay, I am going to hand over to Sylvain Chauquy um, uh, from Paris, who works with Jean-Michel Molina, um, and he is going to present um, on uh, prep dynamics and dosing for uh, women, both cis and trans, both injectable and oral. Um, so Sylvain, if you could share your screen of your presentation, um, we would love to see it. Um, thank you very much. So hello everyone, I'm happy to be there and to present today about prepping women and what is new about prepping women. Um, I have nothing special to declare and I'm not going to be talking today about PrEP for intravenous drug users and the barriers to implementation of PrEP in women because my understanding is that someone else is going to be talking about that today. And I also don't want to talk about the presumed lower adherence of women because I don't think that it is actually a thing. Um, a word on the terminology, as you can see uh, in the medical studies and the clinical studies, uh, medical doctors can be very archaic in their definition of gender and sex. And uh, a lot of times, cis women is used as kind of an umbrella term for any individual that um, is born with a vagina. And so I'm going to be using the term cis women as it has been used in the clinical studies that I'm going to, be, going to be referring to. And so a lot of what I'm going to be saying today about cis women actually applies to anybody born with a vagina with some nuances about intersex and trans men. Um, because of the potential role of hormones, but I'm going to say a word on that at the end, although we have uh, lacking data. So first of all, is PrEP a good fit for women? Uh, yes, of course, otherwise I would not be doing that presentation today. Uh, originally, we had some studies made on macaques and ex vivo studies made on cervical vaginal tissue that showed that um, macaques that were treated here in blue with 
tenofovir FTC, uh, amtricitabine TDF, TDF FTC, uh, compared to macaques that were not treated with uh, the drugs when exposed vaginally with uh, HIV or more accurately SHIV. Um, the macaques not treated had high rate of infection and the macaques that were treated had no rate of infection. We also had proof that in the ex vivo model of infection with HIV, cervical vaginal tissue when exposed to drugs, the more drugs you had, this is here a study on dapiverin, the more drugs you had in the tissue, the less HIV infection uh, you could measure with here a measure of HIV, which is the P24 value. P24 is a protein of, of the virus that we use to measure um, the virus secretion by the tissue. So these were the preclinical studies that showed potential efficacy of the drug as, as, um, as PrEP. And from there, we had um, clinical studies to show PrEP efficacy in women, although the studies show varying efficacy of PrEP um, that can be uh, due to various biological factors, also various adherence uh, in some studies. The main takeaway from all the studies is that with daily tenofovir amtricitabine, we can achieve very high rate of protection. And that's why it is nowadays the main um, recommended treatment for women, uh, daily tdf -FTC. And now that I've said that, what are the new drugs for women and what are the new delivery system? Uh, last time I spoke for the PrEP in Women, uh, PrEP in Europe group, I spoke about the real period long acting uh, injectable drug, but that drug has been stopped by the pharmaceutical um, company as a PrEP and they turned over to the long acting cabotrigravir injectable. So in this study, uh, women were uh, treated with either long-acting cabotegravir injectable every two months or TDF-FTC, tenofovir amtricitabine daily. And that study showed that women in the cabotegravir group had a 89% lower risk of HIV infection, showing a higher efficacy as PrEP of the cabotegravir drug. So this is very promising as a PrEP um, agent. In trans women, uh, the same sister uh, study has been done with MSM and trans women. And in that study, it was very interesting because they had a goal of having at least 10% of trans women uh, included in that study. And they achieved that goal with almost 13% of trans women. And the same results uh, were seen with Cabotrebavir being um, more effective than TDF FTC in preventing HIV. We should always be somewhat careful when we are um, interpreting superiority of a clinical study that was initially designed for non inferiority. But in that particular case, they had to stop the clinical trial early because there was more HIV infection in the TDF FTC group. Um, so this is very, also very promising for uh, trans women. I will just add that I am very eager to see the results specifically in the trans women group, because so far we only have the, the results for all uh, infections and we do, do not possess the results for specifically MSM or trans women. Uh, I wanted to say a word about the dapivirin ring because it has been recommended by the WHO very recently. Uh, it is not as effective as CDF FTC to prevent HIV infection, but it has some uh, preventive um, effect that has been shown in three different studies. The ring study here on the left that was performed in South Africa and Uganda and showed on almost 2,000 cis women, 21% um, reduction, risk reduction 
against placebo. And here in the Aspire um, study performed in many sub-Saharan uh, African countries, 27% risk reduction. And that same study was continued with an open label study, the HOPE study, and showed this time 39% reduction, risk reduction uh, against HIV. So effective for vaginal receptive intercourse, but not as effective as tenofovir and placidivir. Just a word on TAF FTC. Uh, so TAF FTC is a, a drug that very uh, much resembles uh, TDF FTC and has been tested in MSM and trans women. Uh, in the Discover clinical trial, but there was only 1% of uh, trans women, transgender women included in that, in that study. And we do not have um, the results specifics. Uh, we, uh, sorry, we only know that there was no HIV infection amongst trans women. So we can say that there is no uh, inferiority between those two drugs. Uh, but there is no, um, so far, no new studies for TAF FTC in cis women, but I don't think see that as likely uh, as, as you can see here when we are looking at the female genital tract drug concentration of TAF FTC, you can see that they are more than a hundred times fold lower uh, than in the rectal tissue. Although um, in the macaque study, we saw that TAF FTC showed some level of protection in macaques uh, when exposed with vaginal challenge with SHIV. And for new delivery system, there are implants of Islatravir. So Islatravir is a new type of drug, which is a new um, reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And so far, we are in the very first steps of the development of the drug. And there have been only the PK, the pharmacokinetics studies, and they show that with the 56 milligram implant, we can achieve high uh, reliable um, drug concentration over 52 weeks of the drug and that, that are well above the threshold that is deemed to be protective against HIV. So we are in the very first steps of that drug, but it is uh, very promising for the future. Uh, I wanted to say uh, one word for the other news for trans, trans people, because last time that I spoke, we still had a lot of questions about um, what are the potential role of sex hormone therapy on PrEP and what are the potential drug interactions? And there's not a lot of data on that, um, but I think the most robust data that has come in the last year uh, is from that study that showed that in transgender uh, men and women, um, tenofovir level in people taking daily PrEP with the tenofovir and tocitabine were lo lower than cisgender um, women and men, but they were well above the protective levels and they were not related to the levels of hormones. So there is no reason to think that it is related to uh, the sex hormone therapy. So that is the good news for trans people. So all in all, PrEP is highly effective in women, whether it is cis women or trans women. But so far, the main treatment is still tenofovir and antitrusitamine to be taken daily. Um, a new recommended treatment is the dapivirin ring, but it is only for receptive vaginal intercourse, and the effectiveness is lower than tenofovir and antitrusitamine. Some alternatives are on their way. Um, Long-acting cabotegravir seems to be very effective. We have the TAF FTC that is very likely to be um, 
recommended for trans people as well, for transgender uh, women. Although we still have kind of a gray area for receptive vag vaginal intercourse. The on-demand uh, regimen is not likely for women due to pharmacokinetic uh, uh, reasons that we could discuss during the, the panel if you have questions about it. And in the new and future treatments, the implants seem to be very, um, very promising. And if you have questions about the broad neutralizing antibodies and the vaccines, I'd be happy to take them. I wish to extend my thanks to all the people that are helping me with my research. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Silva. Um, uh, Yanis, uh, you have a question. Let me have a quick look. Um, right, can we leave that question till after the three presenters, Yanis? Um, is that okay? Are you going to be? Yeah, you're still going to be around. Fantastic. Okay. So yes, apologies again to people who've had difficulty joining. For some reason, Zoom wanted a passcode when I didn't realise it did. I thought the registration process simply allowed you to click through straight through to the meeting. Please inform your contacts if they're trying to get in through to the meeting that they can re-register and get straight in. Thank you for those of you who persisted in getting here. Um, so, uh, because we started late because of that, I'm going to pass straight on uh, to Irene Ogeta um, from Nairobi in Kenya, um, who can talk about um, her work in being a peer advocate uh, for adolescent girls and young women um, in Kenya, who, as you may know, have one of the biggest PrEP programs in the world. And I asked uh, Irene because I thought her findings might um, illuminate the way forward for working with um, uh, women and prep in Europe. So Irene, uh, if you want to screen share, we'll have a look at your presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Luz. Thank you. Uh, so I will go ahead and try and share my screen. Any problems, I can do it. <laughs> no, sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I believe you can see my screen good. Kindly confirm. It's black at the moment. It says, ah, oh, there it is. Okay, thanks. Thank and, uh, remember, <laughs> Thank to put it, remember to put it on slideshow so we get the full size slides. All right. It should be, I think, should be on slide or something like that. Or just expand your window, it doesn't matter. Let me just try and see. Um, if you can't, forget it, just do it as it is. Now, let me let me just try. Ah, oh, start presentation. That's the thing you need, I think. Okay, just give me a second for it to load. All right, so I'm not sure whether you can. Okay, perfect. Just taking its time, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So maybe to go ahead and introduce myself. So my name is Erin Ogeta. I am a young woman leader who is working with the, with the PINA network as the associate program officer, young women's advocacy. And um, basically I'm going to give a very short um, presentation of the finding of a project that we did uh, in Nairobi and, uh, and also um, in Uganda. So it was the land project was basically I'm just going to try and uh, it was basically a project that was done in um, in Kenya and Uganda, and it was funded by Dream Innovative Challenge. And we implemented under an organization called uh, PIPE in Kenya in partnership with ICW in Uganda. And uh, yeah, I'm struggling to minimize my screen. Um, Thank you, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm just struggling to minimize my screen. So giving an overground of, um, a background of what Athena does, Athena is a feminist organization and it works towards um, a, advancing the voices of young women leadership in leadership spaces, 
and uh, as a fundamental component in HIV and gender equality responses. Apparently, we operate in 10 different countries of Eastern and Southern Africa. And this is basically to give an opportunity for us to be able to feel and demonstrate the impact of uh, peer-led advocacy. So basically, that's our key role, just ensuring that we put the young women at the center of all our programs. So I'm going to request you to help me transit to the next slide, please. Um, Good. Sorry, uh, yeah, I, I can hear you. Um, do you want me to screen share instead? Let me just try and, and quit the whole, it's it's too big. <laughs> I am. I can, I, I, I can do it if you like. So why don't I do that? I think that's probably simpler. Just just one moment and I'll, I'll bring yours up, okay? Uh, and then there we are. And I'll put yours up. Thank you. Uh, I think. Hang on a second. Now I don't know if I'm doing it. Uh, 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 uh. Let me let me just try this, Goose. Thank you. Let me <laughs> let me. Let me <laughs> okay. Let me All right. It's you, right. You, you try. It. You. Yeah. Let me. Um. This will stop. All right. Let me just try and get it right. So. All right. Um. I'm so sorry. I don't know why it's taking the whole screen, <laughs> making it a bit hard to transit to the next page. All right. There so, we are. Yes, yeah, thank you. So um, the land project was basically, um, as I explained, it was run by Athena and under partnership with the uh, ICWE Uganda and, and, uh, and PIPE in Kenya. And it was a dream innovative funded uh, project research project that was um, to get an overview of just trying to explore the views and the preferences of adolescent girls and young women on what they thought about PrEP and uh, the consumption around PrEP, access of PrEP, and just getting to know if they really had an understanding of what PrEP really was that was in Kenya and in Uganda. So our general objectives were to understand and generate collective evidence about the knowledge and the views that they had about PrEP, and also to assess the knowledge that they already had, the skills, the confidence of the adolescent girls that was before the project and also before the dialogues which we used to contact them. It was sort of a methodology that we used to reach the girls in the community. And the topics that were listed are, are just the ones above the HIV, SHR in general and in depth, and also to identify the young women who are at risk. And we went an extra mile out of the context of the project to ensure that we did referrals and follow-ups regarding um, the ones who needed to be placed on treatment and care. So basically, we were. Um, I'm gonna try and leave it. All right. So our project methodology, because it was a peer focused, we were um, young women who were trained, and we were actually acting as the lead projects of this particular um, research project. So it was to promote peer led advocacy and in this aspect we adapted the aspect of peer and community mobilization where the land ambassadors were basically the young women who are trained to act as ambassadors mobilized and and also um engage the other adolescent girls and young women to be able to go through the entire research. And it was a qualitative research where we convened community dialogues with adolescent girls in the community and we hold, we held about 10 community dialogues in total with each dialogue containing about 25 participants. We also, um, our target was adolescent girls who aged between 15 and 24. And because most of them were also in school girls, so we had to also seek parental consent in order to continue engaging these girls, which was very positive from our end. So we had uh, our findings, we, we had issues these girls with uh, pre-questionnaires that we gave them to fill before we started each community dialogue, which entailed knowledge, knowledge exchange and knowledge sharing. And we found out that 80% of the adolescent girls had heard about PrEP before, but 43% um, of them 
thought it was just a pill taken after unprotected sex, you know? And uh, that, way, that clearly takes us to they mistook PrEP for PEP and transmission. And only 33%, about 33% knew it was a pill that is taken every day to prevent them from HIV. So all knowledge and confidence measures improved to in the dialogue during when we were now contacting the dialogue and it indicated a bit of stability and impact in the community dialogue as a method. So some of the views that the adolescent girls had about PrEP, which I find that are really important, especially for any, um, any country, any state which is advocating for PrEP and which is also looking forward to adapting PrEP as one of the preventive methodologies. So I felt they, they brought up issue of choice urgency, accurate information, and also understanding. These were very important to them because thinking about whether they will take PrEP or not, they also brought the issue of trust. It was very dominant. And these came from trusting their partners, knowing their HIV status, and knowing if the partners had other partners who relevant who made the relevant decisions in regards to cons consuming and or even taking a PrEP uptake. And there was also so access was a critical issue. PrEP being free and also inaccessible clinics with no stockouts. And, and that time PrEP was not widely spoken about. There was a bit of discrimination about and the, also the healthcare provider attitude around the girls that went to um, inquire about the services. And so that also came out very commonly. There was also an issue of shortage and rather it's, it's a short term preventive measure because they have to go every three months to get tested and then for them to get a restock. So they felt like that was quite an issue for them. But after all that, they also did highlight there are some benefits they, they felt were really associated with them taking PrEP on a daily basis. So they felt like it gives them a chance and opportunity to stay negative from HIV and it reduces their stress in regards to trying to use any other preventive methods or just feeling anxious all the time about their status. And these made them stay active in school, including those who are sexually active, because we also had some who are going to school, but they were selling sex. It gives them an opportunity to con conceive and without any risk of <coughs> HIV accusation. And this was dominantly in discordant relationships for the young girls and for the adolescent girls and young women. And they're able to have sexual relationships without worry about HIV. So some participants raised the issue specifically about sex work, transactional sex, or having multiple partners. So they did not really have to worry about anything. They also had reduced stress and worry, they had not to worry about contracting HIV. And um, they could conceive, of course, without any um any problems. So they were, they also did raise concerns because they feared that many participants say they disclined or feared taking pills. And again, this brought the issue of they fear taking pills because of the discrimination with that comes along with taking pills. And also um, it is tedious for them. They felt it was a bit tedious for them to take the pills on a daily basis. And so they were actually asking if they could be a long-term like maybe injectable prep, which could be easier for them they just go take the job once in three months and that will really be of great help to them and they feared about side effects the lots of participants cited having worries about side effects they had had or even thought about being associated and this was basically because these are things that they hear they were going with hearsays about this side effect so they brought this as worries and some of the things that they were citing were you know loads of loads of appetite gain of weight and and vomiting and all this and all that and um, they also cited impact of prep on behavior which also cited with some of adolescent girls talking about moral behavior and potential increase in young girls having more sexual partners because they were certain they had a prevent method and then there was the the prioritization of contraception and condom. If HIV risk be removed, where adolescent girls cited that they would rather focus on PrEP, which was a HIV preventive method, than struggle negotiation, negotiating safe sex. And this came and brought the discussion where we had to emphasize that PrEP 
it only prevents HIV and it does not prevent STIs. And someone has to be using family planning for them not to get, you know, unintended and unplanned pregnancy. So managing also the oral, oral pills and using oral contraceptives, they felt that was quite an issue and they were still suggesting for them to have um, the injectable. So some of the challenges of PrEP to adolescent girls out of the research that were evident were there is a lot of pre stigma around PrEP because of the Truvena, either PrEP has a component of Truvena, which also appears to be in the ARVs. So they felt like if someone sees them taking the pill, they will be judged to be HIV positive because people merely go by what they see in the first, the first picture that they see, that's how they judge. And then there was the HIV stigma, clinical barriers. This was associated with transport to the clinical facilities, opening hours and healthcare providers' attitudes. And then we had relationships which brought about trust issues and all that. So out of the land project, we were able to influence a couple of things. And uh, the lessons that were learned from the land project who influenced the Ministry of Health in Kenya to strengthen the PrEP technical working group, which I feel this is something that all countries should adopt because once there is evidence that it's effective and available and accessible, then I think it's one of the best uh, available preventive mechanisms that young women and also other people from all general population who are sexually active to adapt. We also have um, had exceptional policies developed in Kenya because of the advocacy and evidence. There was a variable around HIV prevention and oral prep from land project and other projects from other implementing organizations around prep so all these policies have given us a momentum for prep delivery so ministry of health has also uh given exceptional direction um we also had fulfilling the support the urgency the choice and the rights of adolescent girls and young women is imperative because young women are not are we we are homogeneous we have different needs and priority and one of our biggest priority is having access to hiv prevention and treatment commodities so having access to information which is accurate about prep and the, the access of it and the affordability of it all was really greatly influenced by the advocacy that we did around prep and the research and the findings that we were able to present to the um, health ministry of health in kenya and so peer-led information since Digitization, mobilization, and support have been adopted, valued, and considered effectively. Adolescent girls and young women want to learn about, discuss, and also share the experiences of PrEP with other adolescent girls and young women. That is basically promote peer-led interventions and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, projects, or to to say the least. So they are best placed to understand their points of views. So when I reach out to adolescent girls and we reach out with accurate information, I'm at a better position to convince them that, you know what, this is worth trying and it's mm -hmm. worth adapting compared to when someone else like an adult reaches out to them. So there is also comprehensive, accurate and up-to-date information. It is very critical in sustaining our PrEP intake. So last but not least, my presentation has been a bit long due to technical issues. <laughs> I'm going to conclude by saying that as we adapt and as we look at implementing PrEP, as we continue to scale it up, we need to further research is needed because we need to understand the views. We need to understand the priorities and we also need to understand the preferences of the target population that we wish to reach with the information about PrEP and services about PrEP. And as PrEP champion, personally, I have been able to continue to create my social network with adolescent girls and young women to fill the PrEP information gaps left by service providers, increase trust of PrEP and also help reduce PrEP stigma and misconceptions around it. Thank you very much because this has allowed us to increase appearance and reduce HIV new infections as we look forward to ending the HIV new infections by 2030. I will stop there. Thank you very much, Agu. Okay, uh, wait a minute. I need to put my video on again. There we are. Thank you. That's wonderful, Irene. I'm sorry about the technical problems. We seem to be a bit plagued by them today. Um, I, I I put in a comment myself. Um, I mean, I think a lot of these issues um, apply more in an African context, but there are certain ones that um, um, apply to um, 
uh, women and people unfamiliar with PrEP generally everywhere, and I'd like to sort of discuss those at the end. Um, anyway, um, unless there are any technical questions now. No, Yana, uh, Yana says more of a comment than anything. Um, we will move straight on um, to Anna Silverkrug, who is a physician at, I think it's Belvicha Hospital near Barcelona, isn't it? Um, and uh, she is a physician at uh, what, the STI clinic there and has experience um, uh, prescribing prick for, well, mainly gay men, but also women. Anyway, uh, Anna, if you put up your screen share, we'd love to hear yeah. from you. And same thing with you, you can, that's it. <clears throat> Brilliant. <clears throat> Did I get Belvicha right? <laughs> you... no. Hi. Oh, that's better, yes, we can hear you yeah. now. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, I've been on. Sorry, one more thing. Harriet uh, said, please do remember to speak nice and slowly for the interpreters. Anyway, carry on. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so, hi. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for inviting me to this webinar. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to speak about PrEP for women in Europe, specifically in Spain, because it's the kind of country I live and I know. Um, in Europe, the implementation of PrEP is being slow compared to, to the United States. And here in the map, you can see the status of former PrEP implementation in Europe on October 2020. The countries colored in dark green are those in which PrEP is nationally available and completely reimbursed. As you can see, Spain is one of them. And what uh, do the most important European guidelines say about PrEP implementation? The European AIDS Clinical Society guideline recommends PrEP in men who have sex with men and transgender individuals when condoms are not used consistently and if, when there are also other markers of increased risk of, for HIV acquisition. But they also recommend or say that it may be considered, PrEP may be considered an HIV negative a heterosexual women and other groups in risk for HIV infection. This heterosexual women here applies in this context, uh, obviously to cisgender women. The European Center for Disease Prevention and Control published uh, in March 2021, a technical guidance for the, for the implementation of PrEP in Europe. In this guidance, they highlight that inclusion of recommendations specific to MSM population is necessary, but they also say that there's a need to recognize individuals who belong to other population groups that may be more vulnerable to HIV infection, such as cis females, transgender people, people who inject drugs, people in prisons and other closed settings, sex workers and consumers and migrants from countries with high HIV endemicity, who also have other vulnerabilities, such as having an HIV infected sex partner, having a sex partner who, who injects drugs, a lack of entitlement to healthcare and intimate partner violence. Most of these vulnerabilities are, affect mainly women. The most important Spanish guideline is the Spanish AIDS study group GESIDA guideline published in 2016. This guideline gives recommendations that are very similar to those from the EAC, but more specific and therefore more restricted. Uh, applying to GESIDA, PrEP should be recommended in people belonging to groups at high risk of HIV infection, setting the threshold for high risk of HIV infection in more than two cases per 100 per year. In this definition are included MSM and transgender women who have had condomless sex in the previous six months and have also another marker of risk for HIV. In this recommendation, they include, they include transgender women. Gesida also says that 
that PrEP should be considered in people who may be at high risk or for whom, for whom there is some evidence of benefit, such as people with HIV-infected partners without clinical or biological control, sex workers, injecting drug users who share syringes, and people in situation of social vulnerability. In this consideration, they include both trans and cisgender women. But uh, to know the current situation in Spain, it's important to say that the national healthcare system in Spain is publicly funded and provides universal coverage and free healthcare services. Since November 2019, PrEP is fully covered by the healthcare system. PrEP is exclusively provided within hospitals in hospital pharmacies, and PrEP care is largely based in hospital settings as, as well as some community-based centers. Because of these peculiarities of the national healthcare system from, of Spain, the implementation of PrEP came with coverage criteria. These coverage criteria were, were decided by the health ministry according to a document, a consensus document uh, published in January 2018. The coverage criteria include, uh, on one hand, HIV negative MSN and transgender people with at least two of the following risk criteria, more than 10 different sexual partners in the last year, unprotected, unprotected anal sex in the last year, chemsex use in the last year, administration of PEP, on several occasions in the last year, and at least one bacterial STI in the last year. And on the other hand, they include HIV negative female if they are sex workers who report condomless sex. As you can see, this coverage criteria are much more restrictive than, than those from guidelines. There are not much data about uh, PrEP use for women in Spain nowadays. So I decided to give a, show our data, and I think they are very similar to other hospitals in Spain. In our HIV and STD unit, unit in, we, be, we implemented one of the first PrEP programs in Spain in June 2018, before the complete reimbursement. 250 PrEP users are currently included in our PrEP program. 245 are MSM, three are transgender women, and two are cisgender women. As you can see, uh, this makes a total of 2% of women in the program. It's not very much. But why women do not access PrEP programs in Spain? The, it's the, the principal problem, the most important problem is that the, that the national healthcare system only covers PrEP for women in two cases for trans women with specific risk criteria, like I, I said, and in cis women if they are sex workers. And PrEP cannot be purchased legally by choice. There are no public campaigns promoting PrEP use, and most of the information comes from the LGBTI community, not reaching cis women. Sex workers often find it difficult to talk about their situation for different reasons such as being in a situation of extreme vulnerability, social stigma, or fear, since practicing prostitution is not completely decriminalized in Spain. And when we detect in our unit a cis woman who meets guideline criteria, but not coverage criteria, it is difficult to get them to access them. So I, I want to finish with some possible solutions to this problem. How to get women into PrEP? Obviously, changing coverage criteria, adapting them to the clinical guidelines. On the other hand, making public campaigns, informing about PrEP and promoting PrEP use and specific campaigns to reach vulnerable women, such as sex workers. Training on PrEP use healthcare professionals with an important role in women's health such as gynecologists, midwives, or GPs, and searching other ways to get cis women that meet guideline criteria, but not coverage criteria to access PrEP. 
as we did for all before PrEP reimbursement. Thank you all for your attention. Okay, thanks very much, Anna. Um, I, I'm going to take Chair's prerogative and ask a question about your very last remark. Um, I wasn't sure what you, what you meant about women who meet guideline criteria, but not coverage criteria. What did you mean about that? I'm sorry. Women that, uh, if you see the guidelines, they, they have, to, they could take PEP, but we have a very restrictive we have very restricted coverage criteria and only only sex workers can I got you prep. right so that's what you were talking about yes and I yeah. think um, yeah um, you don't have what I call a get out clause in the Spanish guidelines uh, which I think we do in the UK guidelines um, which is the one that says or people who are at sufficient risk of HIV, um, which is what the EX, yes. a, a well, version we, of that is what the EX guidelines say too. They, they, they could get PrEP because clinical guidelines say so, but we cannot give them because PrEP mm -hmm. is given in, in a hospital pharmacy and mm -hmm. it's not covered, so it's... I got you. Okay, um, listen, um, I am going to hand over to Harriet, um, who will facilitate the discussion. I'll be feeding, uh, I'll be feeding um, questions through to her. Um, so Harriet, you can take over right now to answer your question. Um, I'm not sure whether you've been able to see the questions that people are asking. Uh, so do you want me to, um, to, to ask them for you? Actually, to actually, I, I'll take the privilege to ask some questions first and then come back to you. But Certainly. for the moment, for the moment, I just want to assure everyone that we still have a half hour to discuss what we have heard, which is surprising to me because we have lost some minutes in the beginning due to our technical problems. And now I'm feeling very happy and relaxed that we can discuss and answer probably all the questions that shown up. And I want to thank again Sylvain for the insight to France and Irene from Sub-Saharan Africa and Anna for the Spanish data. My name is Harriet, as uh, Gus has already introduced me. I'm a journalist and I'm a sexologist and I'm in HIV prevention for more than 30 years now and especially interested in women's issues. And um, Sylvain, I'm going to have a first question to you because it uh, has been the first presentation and many of us remember that you came up with the basic information about pharmacokinetics and the tissues and where is the, the, um, the, um, the, the drug going to. And you also gave an introduction about uh, the rectal tissue and the vaginal tissue and the distinction between cis and trans persons. So I want to come back to the question, is it correct to discuss men and women, male and female, or is it better to specifically discuss what, where does the, the drug go? Is it in the genital tract like vaginal uh, cervical? Is it protective for the anal region? Because given the fact that Anna just has reminded us about sex workers, and the fact that there are also women have anal intercourse, receptive anal, receptive anal intercourse. Would you say that we have some data about women are protected in the anal region? Could you specify a bit on that? So uh, that is a very interesting question. And I, I saw in the chat that there is a question about the depivirine ring. And that's why I specified that the Dapivir ring is for vaginal intercourse only. Um, because as many of you probably know, um, women have anal sex as well. And um, this is always a problem when we are discussing PrEP in kind of a gendered or sex-oriented 
uh, manner. An ideal way would probably be, be to try and get out of this gender view of the world and to try and just think about what kind of risk um, sexual acts people have and whether or not they have um, receptive fellatio, receptive anal intercourse, receptive vaginal intercourse, that type of acts and how to protect those acts only. That would be, that would be, I think, probably a better way of thinking about how to implement PrEP. Um, now, we also have to think about the tissues and how the tissues might be different in, in um, for example, the, the, the female genital tract and how sometimes the, um, they can be different in cis uh, gender people and transgender people. Um, for example, the, um, the, the, the vaginal uh, tissue uh, in people born with a vagina and uh, vaginal tissue when there are neo vagina, va vagina uh, can be very different and react very differently uh, to drug concentration and especially retention of drug, which is a very, very important parameter to take into account when we have to think about PrEP and especially the number of days you have to take PrEP after your last sexual exposure. So, well, tough question. Uh, I would say that um, when we have to think about PrEP in women and PrEP in transgender or PrEP in men and PrEP and uh, the first thing to think about is to try and think about whether or not there will be receptive vaginal intercourse because that's kind of the limiting factor. Mm. Uh, this is the hardest to protect. So that's what we have to try and protect because it's the hardest tissue to get drugs into. Does that answer your question somehow? Well, it shows at least how many questions still need to be answered. So thank you for the moment. And I'm seeing Yanis' hand up here. And I think, Yanis, you are going to continue this discussion before I bring the next question. Would you like to put your question here? If, if, it, if it's related. Have you unmuted him, uh, Harriet? Yes, no. good afternoon, yeah. everybody. How's everyone? I would um, never dare to unmute the Yanis. <laughs> so uh, he's not nice, himself. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Um, thank you very much for the presentations. Um, I've been putting some chat in some comments in the chat. I had a question related to the, you know, in terms of pharmacologically um, to, um, to our uh, Parisian colleague. Um, what are you doing in, in practice in your clinic for the dosing recommendation that you as a, as a unit, what, um, sort of a starting dose, I assume you're saying seven days until full, or full protection. Um, and then your um, washout dose, is that seven days or 28 days? And what is that recommendation sort of in the French guidelines? Because I don't remember off the top of my head for cisgender women. And what are you actually telling women in, in clinic? Like after their lack of sexual exposure, how long they should continue um, uh, taking PrEP? And maybe some thoughts from your perspective around the pharmacology around this. Over to you, thank yeah. you. So that, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. That's a question that we have been addressing in the past few weeks. And our unit has been... Um, um, on the forefront of the, the new guidelines in France um, for that. So we that, that's a question that we have been asking ourselves um, quite recently. So, um, so far, we are still um, recommending a leading lead in period of seven days mm -hmm. for women um, because we don't have any data to recommend the two, um, the two pills um, uh, at once, uh, like in MSM. And we, I, I don't see 
how we can recommend that for now. I mean, the first data that we had on that show that it probably won't be working like that in the female genital tract. And as to the, the days and the number of days after last sexual exposure, um, it used to be 28 days recommended and recommended by the WHO as well. Uh, but it was based more on the post-exposure prophylaxis uh, way of thinking. And so we went back on, on that and started trying to think about, first of all, what do people actually do? And we realized that people don't take the full 28 days. Uh, and so at some point, there is no point in uh, recommending some, something that is not done. And uh, when looking back at how long the drugs stay in the rectal and the vaginal tissue after last uh, exposure, it seems more reasonable to recommend seven days to make sure that we can cover the last exposure. So that's what is now recommended in France and in our unit. So that the recommendations are basically based on what we, uh, on what some of the people in our unit uh, wrote up. So that's what we are doing, and that's what we are recommending now in France. And I think that it's probably gonna be the new recommendation for the WHO in the next few months. I th so, th thank you, Sylvain, but I would like okay. to, to relate this to Anna as well, to the Spanish guidelines. Could you just follow up on how the situation is in, in, in Spain at the moment? Spanish guidelines um, are very odd, are from 2016, they do not be, um, say something very specific for women, for how to take uh, PrEP in women. And I think uh, we need an actualization of these guidelines, but they are not here because uh, PrEP for women in Spain is now I think, not a thing. So I'm still passing on this question to Irene because I think the double WHO recommendation is also very important for Sub-Saharan African regions and for your work with adolescent girls and young women. Am I right, Irene? Could you share a bit light with us? Thank you. Thank you very much, Harriet. I think it's, it's really important the WHO guidelines are really important, especially to who do we administer PrEP to and how do we ensure that, how do we even know that this is a person who is at risk? How do we define those individuals whom we consider to be at risk? So I feel like, as my colleagues have mentioned, according to WHO, anyone who falls under any, any area that the high, the, there is high HIV prevalence, anyone who has multiple sexual partners, anyone who is also uh, in a discordant relationship, I feel they all fall under the guidelines of the WHO on who particularly should get access to PrEP. And as Sylvia uh, explained, there is that um, period where you give like seven days after before uh, you someone had engaged in unprotected sex the last you know seven days there has to be testing and then there has to be that also uh, I think there should be an adoption of um, three months window period because we understand that the virus takes about like three months to be able to be detected in the in the system so it will really also be very interesting to have a window period of three months as well as added to the uh, provided WHO uh, guidelines. Thank you, Irene. And I think Gus is going to uh, have a remark, especially on what you just re said now. Um, yes, you can hear me, can't you? Say yes. Hello? Yes, we can. Right, OK. <laughs> Wasn't sure. Uh, yes, I was. that I found was a very interesting point, especially also with relevance to the Spanish guidelines too. Um, I would like to see us moving to um, a demand model rather than a supply model with PrEP. I think we've been too conservative, partially because there was this sort of concern that people would kind of, lots of people who didn't really need protection from HIV would 
rush to get PrEP and swamp the clinics. That's turned out not to be the case. Uh, and especially in non-gay populations, it's about stimulating demand, really. Um, the need uh, isn't matched by the use. Um, and so um, I think we should try and make criteria um, as broad as possible and should concentrate instead on educating and informing people and especially non-gay populations about PrEP. There's a lovely saying by Bob Grant, the pioneering PrEP researcher, the man who did um, IPREX, um, and he said, and I still stick to this, the indication for PrEP is that the person asks for it. In other words, once people reach a specific sort of level of, of awareness and knowledge about PrEP, they obviously need that education first, then they're often quite good judges of their own risk. Um, and, and the fact that they've come forward means that they're probably at risk. They may be too embarrassed to say why they're at risk, but they will, they generally people don't ask for PrEP without needing it. Um, so that, that's really what I wanted to say. I'm not going to sort of butt in anymore. <laughs> and you might have seen many heads on the screens were nodding strongly when you were speaking. So there, this is a, a thing of two steps that need to be done. First is to get the information out to those who might need the information. And second is to increase the demand by an individual risk checking. And I remember in Irene's presentation, that you had a lot of information on the challenges. And I have seen in the chat uh, that there was some question for, is there a ranking in between the challenges? Is there something that you would put first and that you would put more urgent, especially when we try to find your knowledge in European countries as well? So we might learn from you because you're ahead. Could you give us an in, uh, um, kind of kind of order, like you would put it to bring the information as guests said? So um, thank you very much, Harriet. So according to this particular research, because it's something that we, it's a project what we did when PrEP was being rolled out in Kenya, it was not widely embraced and it was, the information was not widely there. So trying to use this, those back moments as an example to the, the current situation and the advocacy that uh, Euro, European is also trying to do for people to consider taking up PrEP. I would say that some of the challenges according to, now when I try to put it with the list of priorities is uh, the availability of the um, of PrEP. Because in Kenya, apparently it's not being sold. It's available for free in all, almost all, actually all uh, government hospitals and government health facilities. So the availability of PrEP as an important commodity and preventive HIV preventive tool should be guaranteed. It should also, the effectiveness of it should also be guaranteed. You know, people need to have access to information. So the challenges is just lack of information about PrEP and then so many misconceptions and myths that surround PrEP. And then when you're looking about clinical barriers, which goes hand to hand with accessibility and also affordability, that's how I will prioritize the challenges. And let's not forget that HIV, there is still a lot of HIV stigma, despite so much advocacy around dismantling HIV stigma and stigma and, and discrimination. So PrEP equally comes with, you know, uh, a lot of stigma. So it's also important that as we consider taking up this advocacy and also pushing for PrEP availability, let us also look for ways of reaching out to people, sensitize, sensitizing people, capacity building about PrEP to dismantle all the misconception and also just to preach a lot of awareness so that it doesn't really discourage because a lot of stigma also affects appearance. So yeah. I'm I'm, I'm reading in the chat that Yanis is commenting on the Kenya PrEP program, and he has said that Kenya has a wonderful PrEP program in his viewpoint. I'm going to ask Yanis to put out and to, to bring an example what you think could be very, could, could serve as an example for us in Europe as well, because um, there was also this remark, I think it was by Sophie, that we need more healthcare pro professionals involved. And Maybe you could also link to that. Great, thank you. Just, I mean, my my perspective is from the onset, you'll, uh, when the two large uh, Sub-Saharan African countries that started the first uh, sort of two 
had PrEP policies and started uh, offering PrEP, South Africa and Kenya. South Africa's approach initially was for sex workers in MSM. First, actually sex workers in their policy document, then the MSM were sort of like taken out, put back in. It was very much a key population um, approach. And that kind of the marketing of PrEP was like, it's a drug for sex workers or gay men. Well, Kenya in its initial approach was actually kind of more sort of um, general population. Um, they had, I think their, uh, um, their, their marketing and their posters and the material they had, you know, heterosexual couple talking about, you know, loving themselves and protecting themselves. And so that approach, and then of course they work with their community-based organizations to try to, to get PrEP delivered to um, uh, men of sex with men and other groups. But I, the marketing um, in, right from the onset in Kenya was it's, it's not just a gay drug, a uh, gay service. And I think that's important. I mean, I, I see that also in, my, in our setting in Greece, right? I mean, already it's like, oh, it's the drug that, you know, gay men from New York are on. Uh, I mean, that's the perception rather than saying it's standard of care and that in line with WHO's recommendation, it's for any person at risk for H acquiring HIV. And you kind of determine that like based on people understanding their own risk, but also in a conversation with, you know, um, well-trained lay providers and healthcare professionals. And I think yeah. just, um, so that's really why I think it's also a robust, very good program, South Africa's as well. Um, but I think it's just, I'm always impressed by also the, the um, insight and the intellect of like Kenyan colleagues around from policymaking they did clinical trial research that fed into kind of uh, WHO's recommendation on PrEP. So um, it's, it's exciting times, but I think the challenges are well articulated um, by our colleague. And I think a lot of work forward, but again, congratulations to Kenyans. And even though we now see that we need probably both the supply and the demand side, I want to go back to Sylvain and to Anna, because um, you are healthcare professionals. And I mm -hmm. wonder what, um, let's start with Sylvain, what you think about your colleagues in France, what should happen, what must happen, what could can happen to um, increase uh, prep perception among healthcare professionals, the relevant healthcare professionals, while Anna is thinking about her answer already. <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. I think uh, one thing that um, is important to have prep education early on uh, in the medical studies uh, I think that should be part of the curriculum early on. Um, I also think that what has been happening in France, the fact that nowadays general practitioners can initiate PrEP and uh, prescribe PrEP is probably helping um, because I think that's also a way to um, diffuse in information uh, when general practitioners can also be aware of, um, of that type of drug and a new means of prevention it will probably be um, there'll be it, it will increase awareness um, I think also the just increasing education as a whole in the whole um, society would help uh, if more people knew what PrEP is about um, in general. Maybe more doctors would be uh, interested and intrigued by, by it and would be looking into it. Uh, but that, that is a, a tough question. Um, I'm still quite baffled when um, some colleagues don't seem to be knowing what PrEP is and how to react with that. And sometimes don't uh, or, or seem to think that uh, because one um, individual is taking PrEP that they are actually uh, people, uh, someone living with HIV. Uh, so it's still, still uh, there's some, some miles to go. 
Uh, I think we, we should start with um, the med school. With the med school. Probably, yeah, probably a first step. And, okay. Is, would you agree, Anna, or do you have different ideas? Yes, I agree. Med school is the, the first step. But I think for a lot of, a lot of us, it's too late. So now we have to give uh, to train our colleagues, uh, mostly those who are in who give, give care for women or other minority groups, other vulnerability groups, and we are trying to here. We are training our colleagues from other, other departments here in our hospital. We are trying to, and also uh, NGOs for from sex workers, because it's another problem here. Sex workers don't get women, women don't get the information. All information comes from uh, NGOs, uh, from the um, LGTBI collective. There are no other information channels now in Spain. So I think we have to change this, the channels. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more question, Anna, because I've seen in the chat that there was a question for numbers. Do you yeah. have any numbers on how many women in Spain are on PrEP already? Yeah, no, we have no official data, but uh, approximately 4,000. 4,000 women or 4,000 people? Mm -hmm. People, in general, yes, yes. So right, so only 4,000 people, not women. Mm -hmm. No okay. women, no women. Just clarifying <laughs> that. <laughs> no, no. So I'm I'm asking Yanis, who has his hand uh, on my screen, at least I can see the yellow hand, uh, to unmute himself and to share what you think or what you want to hear from our panelists. So I think uh, to our European colleagues, I have a question in terms of, um, so, I know in France, you're now obviously moved to prescribing, offering PrEP through your GPs, general practitioners. This is something that I work, you know, directly with the WHO Ukraine country office. And we made that recommendation and it's being implemented, even though PrEP is basically delivered through aid centers. The next phase is because we also have kind of heterosexual transmission that is not insignificant and concerning in, um, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. And also like, you know, the epidemic being fueled from injecting drug use. So uh, one of the thoughts is, I mean, we've said this, but we, ha we haven't done it at the country level is actually, and uh, Anna mentioned it very nicely in her slides, is actually getting on board the gynecologists. So, I mean, I, if I just think from the perspective of my country in Greece, people don't, we don't really have strong primary care. So people don't have a PCP GP. Women uh, go all women. You know, women have uh, health, better health-seeking behavior than men, and they go to their gynecologist. And so, I mean, the way I think we what we should be doing, in addition to the med students, absolutely younger generation of providers that should be sensitized before they leave medical school, nursing school, is actually to grab a hold of the gynecologist and do more training around strengthening. Um, uh, SRH and new technologies, new, um, I don't like to say PrEP is a new technology, but it is in the eyes of so many. Um, and so I don't know, maybe from uh, the perspective of uh, in Spain or France, what are the efforts uh, around the HIV ID experts kind of doing some webinar training, whatever that is with, with their colleagues in who are gynecologists um, as well, because I think that's an untapped area still in, um, in Europe, absolutely, and in the rest of the world. So maybe if you can comment on that, Anna or Silvano. Yes, we are doing that. We are doing that, We're trying to train gynecologists, but in a very local way. So I think we have to do that more in all Spain and maybe webinars, maybe something that can reach more people because it's, it's very important. O also GPs, because GPs here are not aware of PrEP use. They can't give PrEP because PrEP is an, uh, pharma, uh, only in, it's given only in hospital pharmacies, but they, they don't know 
about PrEP very much. So the, this is also an important training to teach. So um, yeah, that, that's actually a very good idea. So um, local, sorry, I was muted for a second. So locally, we have been doing some things as well, but we have been targeting um, um, the people doing the deliveries. I'm not sure uh, about how we call them in English, midwives. Is that, is that the word? The word? Um, so we have been training midwives uh, to learn about PrEP. So they cannot prescribe it themselves, uh, but by knowing about it and talking about it and referring uh, people to the Planned Parenthood, um, they can perform the first uh, screening and uh, pretty much do the almost the first uh, consult and prepare um, women for um, for for prep, and so by doing that, we have had some success uh, in get, in getting some some women in into the the prep program in our hospital. Um, so baby steps. <laughs> I'm I'm. But that's um... a, that's a very good idea. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very pleased, very happy to see that we discussed the issues around PrEP in a broader framework of sexual health and rights and a broader framework of uh, health care for women. So now that we are um, going slowly towards the end of our discussion, I want to ask Gus, uh, what are the questions that we have not yet addressed in the chat? Because I have the feeling we have most of them addressed and there's one big question that I still have, and I wonder if I could ask all our colleagues from the ECA region, those who get the, the Russian translation, if there is any specific questions from that community here, I would like to give this still the chance to participate. And in the meantime, Gus, can you look for any not yet answered questions? Would that be helpful? Yes, sure. Um, I did want to ask Ennis, because you mentioned specifically the Depivirin ring. Um, and in the previous webinar we had, which was the PrEP um, pipeline webinar that uh, we did jointly with AVAC and the ATG, um, there was a lot of questions about why the Depivirin ring hadn't been licensed in Europe, would it be a good idea, things like that. So I just wondered if you got any comments about that, if you see a place for it in Europe. Absolutely. Um... Can you hear me? Yes. yes. So I worked, I helped the WHO on this kind of uh, joint uh, approval between WHO and the EMA, where they approve products that are relevant to sort of low middle income countries. So the Depivirin ring was this. So I know it's, we can refer to the efficacy as being modest or moderate. I'm not part of the working group that's like, that's writing the, the technical guidelines right now. I probably will see them at some point, but yeah, we know it's not as you know efficacious and effective as oral-based uh, prep tenofovir, um, but it, the the reason it was, I mean, it worked. It just didn't work as well, but it became another option for women. So, in especially in generalized epidemics where you know the the you know the if a woman can't negotiate or use condoms and can't use or access oral prep you know, HIV would be like, you know, the result. And so um, the, 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 the pivoting ring would be an additional option. And it's again, in the spirit of choice uh, as part of uh, sort of uh, um, SRH services to, to women. But I think for Europe, your question, Gus, in Ukraine, again, I think it'd be, and, and I don't think just in Ukraine, I'm just advising the Ukraine right now, I think again in the in the in the concept of choice of evidence-based tools, uh, I think it 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 should be available. It may not be something that is being kind of, but, but I, I would offer that choice to to women, and I would make sure this com the product itself was um, approved, available. There'd be a policy on it, um, and I think it it definitely has a space in in Eastern Europe epidemiologically. Um, but in terms of choice, 
I, I think even in Western Europe, uh, I, and I think we just need a little bit more engagement with the, the developer, the international partnership of microbicides. I had a call with them a few months ago about it for Ukraine, because I said, we'd like to, you know, I, I mean, I just try to put myself in the shoes of somebody who wants, you know, more choices um, to keep themselves. Yanis, Yanis, I, I want to stop you here, not just because <laughs> of the time, but also because you but mentioned. That's, that's what I can you, say on that. Yeah, but, so, but, but you also um, used one word that I would like to emphasize very much. What we need for women who have a demand for PrEP is to have a choice. And to have the choice, we need the information, we need the access, we need the financial mesh, uh, um, um, sub, the, the financial um, aspects covered. So I'm looking at my time um, counter here, the little watch that shows that we have three minutes, <laughs> uh, that we have three minutes left. And I know that Gus is going to say something. So from my side, I want to thank again the very, very great presentations from Anna, Sylvain and Irene and all the questions. I'm, I'm pretty sure we have at least, um, well, not really answered them all, but sort of. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much, Gus. The floor is yours now again. If, okay. if I may, I just oh. saw one question that I would like to address really quickly. Someone asked <laughs> about yes, uh, sure. during the study uh, between Cabotrigravir and TDF-FTC about adherence. And so very quickly, uh, we do not have all the results right now, but basically all the, the infections that occurred, the HIV infections uh, in the TDF-FTC seem to be, and I'm doing that very quickly, so I cannot go into the detail, but they can be attached to a lack of adherence. All the people uh, at some point stopped uh, taking TDF of FTC or FTC when they, um, and now they that, acquired HIV. So yeah. now that Gus okay. has only one, one minute, I have to have a little <laughs> tip for you. Save the chat. If you want to read all the things again, <laughs> save the chat. And now, Gus, and, please. And we have another one. We uh, this is uh, so it's a good job. Um, we have our second uh, webinar uh, on July the thirteenth. Got two speakers confirmed. I'm trying to find a woman who is actually taking prep and who would be prepared to talk. That would be my ideal third speaker. So if you have someone in mind, please let us know. And I'm also seeking somebody from Eastern Europe because. Um, uh, there are people listening here from Ukraine and Russia, but um, uh, it's not always easy to talk. Thank you very much, everybody. Sorry about the technical problems. In the end, I think most people who actually wanted to join did, uh, because although we only had 26 participants, um, I answered all the emails I got from people who couldn't join. So, you know, I think it was OK. Um, so make a date for the 13th of July, same time. Um, and... Um, we will continue the conversation, which is the great thing about having two webinars. I will summarise the discussion, uh, which will be easy to do because we have a splendid um, um, a chat um, file. Um, and I would like to thank you all very, very much for joining. I would like to thank particularly um, Sylvain, Irene and Anna uh, for um, for speaking and also uh, Harriet for chairing the discussion in her very fair-minded way because she's a great chair um, and also very much thanks to um, uh, Miroslav and Zenia. Um, I was listening in on the Russian channel every now and again and you seem to be doing a splendid job and we'll see you again on the 8th. Many thanks and I'm going to end it now um, but if you've got an outstanding question it will be recorded in the chat file okay thank you very much. Thank you bye. Bye bye everybody. Stay safe and well, everybody. Take care.